you know, this study was designed uh, to evaluate blunatumab uh, in the frontline setting in combination with intensive chemotherapy with a hyper uh, backbone. Um, so we know from other studies that blunatumab is very effective um, in the setting of relapsed refractory B-cell ALL, um, and also importantly to eradicate MRD for patients who have persistent uh, MRD after initial chemotherapy. So the idea was that if we incorporate blinitumab into the frontline setting across the board, uh, that we would uh, deepen responses, uh, which should hopefully lead to decreased uh, rates of relapse and ultimately higher cure rates, uh, but also that if we incorporate a very effective regimen um, in the frontline setting, that we could potentially decrease the amount of chemotherapy that we have to deliver. Um, so we, what we're trying to do in the study is to shorten actually the duration of chemotherapy, the total intensity of the chemotherapy patients receive, so that hopefully this will also, in addition to improving uh, long-term outcomes, uh, will also decrease potential treatment-related morbidity or mortality that can be associated with intensive chemotherapy regimens. Sure, so this is uh, you know, a phase two study. The primary endpoint is relapse-free survival, although, although of course we look at response rates and uh, you know, other uh, survival outcomes. Um, uh, patients, uh, uh, eligible patients have uh, newly diagnosed Philadelphia chromosome negative B-cell ALL. Um, uh, you know, the exclu exclusion is relative, or the inclusion is relatively um, uh, broad. Uh, the only thing that we particularly exclude is patients with act with uh, significant uh, central nervous system disease uh, because of the potential interaction of blinitumab um, and it, its potential role uh, or ability to cause neurotoxicity. So the study design itself uh, is we give uh, four cycles of hyper CVAD um, followed by four cycles of blinitumab consolidation. Um, and then a maintenance, uh, which is actually a truncated version of uh, POMP. Uh, and so typically POMP maintenance is given for three years. Uh, and so what we've done is we've cut that about in half and then we intersperse blunitumab uh, into the maintenance phase. So we give three cycles of POMP followed by one cycle of blunitumab and we alternate that. So in total, the, the hyper CVAD portion is cut in half. So from eight cycles to four cycles, and then the total maintenance phase uh, is cut in half as well from about three years to a year and a half. The uh, overall, all patients achieved a complete response. Uh, and importantly, we looked at MRD negativity because we know that this is associated with, you know, with better long-term outcomes for patients with ALL. Uh, and all, all but one patient, so 97% of the, the treated patients, uh, and we've treated 38 patients to date, so 97% of patients uh, achieved MRD negativity. Uh, most of those before blinitumab, but there were three patients who were MRD negative, uh, who were MRD positive prior to the initiation of blinitumab, uh, and all of those uh, achieved MRD negativity. So uh, as I mentioned, the primary endpoint was the relapse-free survival. Uh, so among the 38 patients treated so far, uh, there have been seven relapses uh, and two deaths in remission. Uh, notably, uh, all of the relapses were in patients who had some baseline uh, high-risk feature. So in total, the two-year relapse-free survival uh, is 71%, uh, and uh, the two-year overall survival uh, is 80%. And we think that this looks like it compares very favorably uh, to historical um, outcomes. We've looked at this in comparison with a regimen that we did of hyper CVAD and ofatumumab, so an anti CD20 antibody, so uh, without the blinitumab. Uh, and the two year overall survivals are the same, but we're beginning to see a plateau of the curve. And so if that, if that uh, persists, uh, then we, it looks like the long term uh, outcomes of this may be superior to uh, you know, typical, reg typical hyper CVAD regimens without blinitumab. You know, we know that uh, treating any uh, acute leukemia, and in particular uh, ALL, that it's important to give the most effective regimen in the frontline setting. So because we know that uh, once a patient is relapsed, um, even if we have very effective agents at that point, the likelihood of achieving a long-term uh, cure uh, is relatively low. So 
Uh, I think that this certainly shows the feasibility of this approach of incorporating these effective regimens, in particular blantumab, into the frontline setting. And because our, our goal really is, can we cure patients uh, in the front line and you know, not wait and save these drugs for potentially the relapsed refractory setting? So I think this is where the field is moving. I think that we will see other, and there's a lot of other studies evaluating similar concepts of integrating either inotuzumab, ozogamycin, or blenitumab in the frontline setting. Um, and so what we're doing now is actually the study's now been amended. And so what we're going to be doing is in, in, incorporating inotuzumab, ozogamycin, in addition to blenitumab into the frontline setting. And then the goal will be a kind of a total therapy in the frontline setting for patients with ALL, uh, aiming for as high cure rates as possible. And hopefully also uh, without a need for transplant for many of these patients. So kind of a, a, a transplant free, uh, 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 minim, minimal chemotherapy regimen that incorporates these highly active novel agents into the frontline setting. I think that uh, we're particularly encouraged uh, uh, by the high MRD negativity rate. Um, and then looking at the patients uh, who have relapsed, all of those did have uh, uh, you know, high risk baseline features. So in, in this particular study, a third of patients had a high risk uh, you know, genomic abnormality, uh, so poor risk cytogenetics or others. And so those are the patients that we still, you know, some of them certainly did relapse. But for patients without a baseline um, uh, high-risk abnormality, we've seen no relapses to date, so that's very encouraging.